Okay, so we're going to get started um, with exercise 215, and today it's kind of a combo of Rhino and V-Ray. Um, we're going to get into starting the environment creation in V-Ray. It's not going to be the photorealistic cloudy sky environment quite yet. That's next class. But we're going to work our way into that. Uh, essentially, what you'll be creating yourself today is what I gave you in the exercise 208 sample file. So you'll get to that point where you can create it, and we'll walk through it. Um, we'll, we'll touch a little bit on what we did last class with the skyscraper. Um, I'm going to ask that you use the file from last class. If you really hate your skyscraper and want to change, then change and make a new skyscraper. That's OK. Uh, remember that your, um, your assignment skyscraper is a little bit taller than the exercise skyscraper. So you'll actually be creating a different one um, for, the, uh, for the assignment. So I'm going to go ahead and open up, uh, and actually I already have open, the file that I created last class, the skyscraper that I, that I built out last class. And um, as we start to get this one ready to um, bring into a new scene, I want to make sure that I've kind of clarified where, what, what's going on with my layers. I'm going to end up using this as a block. And so for some of you, you have multiple skyscrapers all lined up in a row like I did originally. Um, I don't remember whether I saved them in this file. Yeah, they're all here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the skyscraper that I like, the one that I want to keep, and I'm going to get that into a new file. And I'll do that by selecting it, and then I can go to the Edit menu. I'm not using the Transform menu. I'm using the Edit menu here, and I'm choosing Copy. That's a copy to clipboard, not a copy within the file itself. So now that is on the clipboard, and I can go to File and then New. Uh, no. Large object inches. And then I can go to edit and then paste. And it will drop in the, uh, the skyscraper. There it is. So I want to organize this a little bit better too before I, I use it as a block. So let me view this just the shaded mode for right now. I'll take this file and I'm going to move it over to the origin. So I'll go ahead and type move or go to transform and then move. I already have my object snaps turned on with end, point, mid, and perpendicular. I'm going to take this corner right here, and I'm going to move that to 0, 0, 0. So I'll go ahead and type that in, press Enter. Let me zoom selected. There it is. And so I have my object at the origin. So basically, I'm, I'm prepping. I'm getting ready to use this as a block. We've used objects as blocks before, so there's nothing too new about this. Uh, I have a bunch of extra layers that have been installed for me uh, that showed up in the default file. We can get rid of all of those. Let me change and make Skyscraper the active layer. And then I'll hold down Shift, select all the remaining layers, and press the Delete key. Uh, layer default has five objects. Yes, I want to go ahead and delete. Go ahead and get rid of them. And now we're down to just the Skyscraper. Uh, I have a layer called Skyscraper. Then I have a separate layer for each of the building components from floor to skin to ceiling to core, all of those uh, as separate. Last class, I went through it and I assigned materials to all of those layers. Um, I suggest that you use the skyscraper light or dark um, on the digital tool site. So if you went to today's exercise, right there, at the very bottom here, I have the skyscraper dark glass and the skyscraper light glass. Uh, this is not true glass. It's not rendering as true glass. It's an approximation of what that kind of highly reflective dark glass looks like on a skyscraper. And I did two versions when I created it. One is dark and one is a little bit lighter, depending on the look that you're going for of your overall building. That's a, that's a personal preference. You can download them both and try them out and see. Since we're on the exercise page, uh, it's also a good idea to go ahead and download the SF Downtown 3DM file, which is where we're going to put our building. So this was a file that I got from grad school. Uh, it was not from my class in grad school, but it was from an, another group of students uh, who built it to work as kind of a backdrop. It is dated, so <laughs> the, uh, the file is circa like 2005-ish. But I don't have a replacement for it, so this is what you get. <laughs> um, the, other, the other factor in that is, uh, so I basically translated, there's no Salesforce building. You get the idea, right? Um, so 
but it'll work. Uh, and it'll certainly give us some context for our renderings, which is also good. The other problem with the file is that it was originally created as a mesh file, not as a NURBS file, so it's a very heavy file. That can cause some issues to, for some people down the road. Um, I have had students start to work on this file, and then suddenly their Rhino file balloons to like a couple gigs. Something goes wrong, and it does that. It shouldn't do that, but I throw that out there. Anyway, we're using it as a block reference, so worst case is you trash it and open it again and bring your file in um, because it's not your skyscraper. So to download it, I would click on uh, it. It's actually hosted by Dropbox so that the download's a little bit faster than my server. Um, so you want to click on it. You don't need to save it into your Dropbox. You can just download, direct download right here, and it will start downloading. It's a 62 megabyte file, so it's going to take a little while, so you'll want that to kind of go ahead and start downloading in the background. So I'll let that go for right now. We'll come back to my skyscraper file. We want to make sure that everything's set up correctly. I'll go through and verify my materials. So first off, I'll switch this over into rendered mode. So we can see it in rendered mode. Then I'll go to V-Ray, and I'll go to my V-Ray material editor. I want to make sure that all these materials load correctly. Uh, I have my concrete no seams. It does load correctly. That's what I put on all of the floors. I have my concrete with my um, plywood form ties. That's for my core. I have my glass. That is my skyscraper glass. Um, and I forget whether I picked the light version or the dark version, but it's there. And then I also had texture sheetrock for the ceiling. All of those have been applied to my layers like that. I also spent some time getting the texture mapping correct on the building itself. It was pretty easy for the overall skin, um, but I made some adjustments to it. So with the skin selected, I went in and I created my texture map. I'll go ahead and create it again for the repetition of it. Most of you created it last class, but I'll do it again anyway. So let me get rid of the, uh, the texture mapping. I'm going to create a new box mapping. And on that box mapping, um, it's going to be a bounding box. It's going to be world. It's going to be capped. There it is. Then I want to show my mapping, which is going to show it like this. This is designed to be, the texture that I made is designed to be one floor, so 16 feet, by a window panel and by a window panel. So it's 16 feet by 4 feet by 4 feet. So I'm going to use the scale 1D commands. So I'll go to transform and then scale, scale 1D, or I can type scale 1D. And I'm going to scale this such that this side here is 4 feet. And I'll repeat the scale 1D. I'll right click to repeat. And this side here is also going to be 4 feet. So I've divided that so that it's a 4 foot by 4 foot square. And then my height needs to be 16 feet. So I'll come down here to the bottom and we'll type in 16 feet. Now in this scenario, when I did my scaling, it showed up at the top. I need to make sure that it lines up correctly on my floors. Let me zoom select it on my object here. There we go. And I want to snap this so that it ends up on my, uh, basically on the ceiling of the floor below. Because this part of the, the texture is going to be, even though it's transparent in the preview, it's going to be solid. And the opposite, this part is the transparent part. So I want to make sure that lines up to my floors. It's going to get a little messy down here at the bottom, that, that extra story. I'm not going to worry about it. We're just going to go with it. So on my particular uh, object, it's a little bit messy because of the shape. And I get this, this artifacting. Um, this is something that I would need to sort through and kind of correct after the fact, um, depending on how I want to do the texture mapping. I have some different options. I haven't done this ahead, so I'm not sure which one's going to be the right one. But I'm going to go ahead and do it in front of you so that you guys can see me struggle through it because you would end up struggling through it too. Uh, so in this scenario, I have the uh, overall skin as one object. Uh, I need to break it apart so that I can select individual parts here. So I'm going to go ahead and type explode. And that's going to allow me to select the individual surfaces, that surface and that surface, for example. Uh, and those are separate and apart from um, the rest of the surfaces. Notice that when I exploded the object, none of the rest of the texture mapping, actually none of the texture mapping changed at all for me. So we'll go ahead and select these two pieces, sorry, that piece and this piece here. 
Those are kind of all the same, so I'm going to do the texture mapping to all of them at once and see how it works out. So first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of the current texture mapping because it's not working. So with those four surfaces selected, I'll come over and I'm going to delete my mapping altogether, which gets me back to where it doesn't look right at all. Now I'm going to go through and look at my other primitives and see if there's another one that I think might work a little bit better. I'm going to try the cylindrical mapping on this one. So we'll go ahead and do the cylindrical mapping. I'm going to uh, do a bounding box of those. Same thing, I'm going to do world and capped. It really doesn't make any difference because I'm not capping anything. So I'm going to go ahead and say no at this point. Then I'm going to show the mapping on those objects. And there's my cylinder. So at this point, I need to shrink the cylinder down so that it gets a lot shorter. So I'm going to do a scale 1D. There we go. And I might need to turn on the quadrant snap so that I can snap to the sides of this circle a little bit better. And so there we go. From that side down to there, I'm going to make that 16 feet, which is going to divide up my floors correctly. I do need to move this down a little bit, so I will move it. Let me snap to that quadrant, and I'll move it to there. That at least makes my floors line up correctly all the way down. And I don't notice how I don't have that artifact in the middle anymore that I had. So I'm already a lot closer. I don't know that this is divided up the same way that I had it divided up. Uh, so I might try scaling this uh, so that this is four feet by four feet. I don't know for sure that that's going to work. But let me try, go ahead and try it. I'm going to do a scale 2D here. Well, no, I'll do a 1D and do it one at a time. We'll go from this quadrant here over to that quadrant there. And we'll say that that is four feet. And we'll scale from, let's go from this quadrant here to that quadrant there. And we'll do that one at four feet. And it's a little bit better. I probably will end up needing to render it to kind of double check. It looks like I'm getting a weird gap going down there, in which case my texture mapping isn't quite right. I might need to scale it back out. Uh, and see it. And this is where rendering ultimately starts to, to play an, uh, a role. I'm going to go ahead and undo that. I'm going to Control-Z because I think it was better when it was here. Even if I lose the dividing lines, at least I'll have the colors, the bands working through. So we'll leave it like that. I did notice that my top right here had uh, a bunch of windows applied to it. That shouldn't be the case. That should really be uh, some kind of a concrete. So I'll change the layer. Uh, let's go ahead and put that on the floor layer. Let me change object layer like that. And you can see that it's got a repetition pattern, but I'm not going to be rendering that close to it, so I'm not overly worried about it. I did not do the texture mapping on the core just yet, so it wouldn't hurt for me to do the texture mapping on the core. So let me take those four and the top here, and we'll go ahead and texture map those. I'm going to apply um, a box mapping to it. We'll do a bounding box, world, cap it. Yes, go ahead and cap it. I'm going to do an x equals y equals z so that they're even. Um, and they probably need to go way, way down here. This is probably, um, let's try 100. Oh, I didn't lock it. There we go. And we can see, OK, well, in terms of divisions, this would be 4 feet. So this is 30 feet. Um, uh, so there would be about 4 of them. Five of them? No, 16, 32. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be a few more than this. So let's increase that number. Uh, let's go to 150 or so. Oops, wrong direction. Uh, let's go 50. Let's see? All right, that feels, that feels a little bit better. Maybe 75. I'm just trying to approximately get that texture map to look correct. OK, sounds good. So I have that set up. I've done all my texture mapping. I'm fairly happy with how it's turning out. At this point, I'm going to save this as its own file. So I'll go to File and then Save As. And I'll put this into today's folder, not 214. This will go into 215. And we'll say this is exercise 215. I clearly can't type today. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. OK, so I have that saved. By this point, my SF downtown file should have downloaded. So I can go ahead and open that one up. 
I'll go ahead and just click on it to open it. It'll open in its own Rhino file. There we go. And so like I said, this is a mesh file. That was how it was created originally. Uh, and let me, let me orbit and zoom out just a little bit. And you can start to see the density of this. So it is actually a pretty dense file. There's a lot of buildings that have been included in here. Uh, and Rhino likes to kind of get a little bit slow because of the size of this file. If it's starting to be too slow, the good news is we can come to the layer and turn off the uh, SF model layer. And then suddenly everything moves quickly again. I'll turn that back on for right now so that you guys can see it. Uh, there is something that I mentioned here that's optional that I will, I will come to and I'll come back to. It's called a V-Ray proxy object. Uh, and sometimes it's really useful when you have something this heavy uh, because it'll take some of the, the weight out of it in your Rhino file, make it a little easier to work with. I'll come back and I'll explain that. So I'm going to gloss over it because it's really optional as part of what we're doing today. But I at least like to introduce it as a concept. So as part of this uh, San Francisco city file, I created uh, basically a foundation a 100 foot by 200 foot lot, so to speak, that's on, that's that little blue piece right there that will help you orient your file into the downtown of San Francisco. Uh, if you really wanted to put it somewhere else, that's okay, but this gives us a pretty good shot at it. The other thing that I'll point out is I have two preset perspectives that will show you street level views of your building looking down the street. Um, they are saved under set view. I have perspective one and perspective two. Your assignment asks you for a third view, so you'll have to create that third view. It takes time and practice to get the view right um, and to get them looking correct and not be inside another building or another shape and, and whatever. So you'll have to spend a little bit of time working on that. So I have these two views set up, but before we can uh, use those views, we need to actually insert our building into this scene. So like I said, I gave you a foundation that's to help you out a little bit. We're going to go ahead and go to Edit, and then Blocks, Insert Block Instance. And I'm going to choose that skyscraper file that I just built. And there it is. I'll go ahead and say Open. Uh, all of this is fine. We'll say OK. Then in this view, I want to make sure that I'm linking the file as a reference. So those are set as Link and Reference. I'll say OK. And there's my skyscraper. So it's coming in. It should snap to one of the corners here. It looks like I don't have my object snap on. Let's go ahead and turn that on. And I will snap to one of the corners. Now, in my building, the exciting side is over here. So I don't really want to bury that in the back. So I want to rotate it around. So it may take a little bit of time to get this oriented correctly. So let me go ahead and move this. And I'll move it from right there. And we'll move it over to maybe that side there. Then I will rotate around that point to bring it around to right there, I hope. And there we go. So now the more exciting side is, is facing this corner, which is looking down the street, we'll be able to see it. OK, that sounds, that sounds a little bit more interesting. And you may also find that you want to go back and redesign your building based on where it goes in the city, too. Uh, and that's, that's certainly OK. So now I have my building, and it's inserted into the city, which is good. Notice my layer stack here has the SF background, the model. Then it has uh, the building pad. That's where you're going to put. That's the lot that you're putting your building on. And then it has referenced files for my skyscraper and all of the various pieces of, uh, of my skyscraper. So that's good. Everything came in the way I wanted it to. We'll keep that minimized for right now. So when it comes to rendering this kind of a view, when we're rendering the skyscraper in context, we could try to create a perfectly photorealistic rendering where we applied textures of the neighboring buildings on the buildings and whatever. If you were, let's say, uh, rendering a movie scene where you needed to have CGI effects and whatever, that would be important. For our purposes, we just need basic massing to understand where it is in context. We don't really want people to focus on all the other stuff. Uh, furthermore, it's a whole lot easier to go to the site, take a photograph, and render your building and collage it in than 
to apply those materials to all the surrounding buildings. So instead of doing this as a photorealistic rendering, we're going to do it as if our model exists in a white sea of buildings. So we're going to take away the context of the city, other than these are how big the buildings are around us. So I'm going to apply a material to the San Francisco City Mall model, the foundation, um, and not to my building. And I want that material to be some kind of a nice whitish material. I've found good luck with the uh, white porcelain material. It's a little bit shiny. It gives us some reflections. Uh, it tends to look pretty good at this scale. So that's what I'm going to use. I'll go into my V-Ray uh, material editor. And I'm going to load in the white porcelain. I happen to already have it loaded in because I'm giving you the file anyway. But I could right click and say load material. And I would go into my flash drive, into my resources, into V-Ray, into V-Ray materials. And I would look for porcelain. There it is. And there should be a white porcelain right there. Uh, and so like I said, I already have that loaded, so I'm not going to load it again. I'm going to take that white porcelain. I'm going to right click on it and say apply material to layer. And I'll make sure that that is both on the SF model there, but also on the um, apply material to layer, uh, but also on my building site, so the thing that my building sits on. That way, everything will end up just kind of being white, except for my building, which is perfect. So now I have the building in the, in the, uh, in the city file. I have my materials applied correctly. It's time to start establishing the V-Ray environment to do the rendering. And so thus far, we've been focused on create a directional light, create a little camera, and that's it. We're going to take this a step further now, because we're actually going to place real sky and a real sun into this scene. So we're going to be able to pick a time of day and that, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and save this right now. I'll go to File and then Save As. And I'll put this into today's folder. Give it a second. Remember, it's a big file. OK, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and load the V-Ray toolbars, because they're not showing up yet. Uh, so I'd like to see those before I move on. So I'm going to go up to my tools. I'm going to go to Toolbar Layout. I'm going to go to File, and then Open. I'll go to my flash drive, where I have that V-Ray toolbar saved. It's under Resources. There it is. And we'll go ahead and load that up. It just makes my life a little bit easier to be able to click on the Sun button, for example. So we're going to do two things. First thing we need to do is to establish the Sun. But before I do that, I want to have a layer for the Sun to go on. So I'm going to create a master layer called Environment. And I'll be consistent with this. I'm always creating an Environment layer. And then underneath that, <coughs> as a sublayer, I'm going to create a layer for Sun. There we go. So I have the sun layer. I'll click the check mark on the sun layer to make it the active layer. That will allow me to insert the sun on the sun layer. It's always important to put the sun on its own layer, because you may end up doing multiple renderings with different suns, different times of day. You also, in which case you have multiple layers for the different times uh, and the different suns in the scene. But you also may end up doing a night rendering down the road, and you'll want to turn the sun off. So you need to know where the sun is so you can turn the sun off as appropriate. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that it's on the sun layer. And I'm going to come over to the V-Ray toolbar, and I'm going to click on the sun button here. And this is actually adding a sunlight system. So when I click on it, we get a dialog box that pops up called the Sun Angle Calculator. Uh, and so some of you will end up down the road taking a class in uh, like environmental uh, effects of buildings or something like that. It's at Berkeley, it's called 140, I think. And you'll use um, you know, sun diagrams, and you'll figure out times of day and all this kind of stuff. We don't need to know that much. And furthermore, we're not going to have manual control on. We're instead going to uncheck manual control, scroll down to the bottom, and guess what? There's a bunch of places that we can pick. So we don't have to think here. We just have to type in San Francisco. So lo and behold, San Francisco is already listed for us. That's good. If you were doing a rendering that was nearby San Francisco, it's kind of close enough. 
we don't have to be super precise. We'll pick San Francisco if we're kind of in Northern California. We'll pick uh, like Los Angeles if we're in Southern California. You don't have to like pick Irvine versus Los Angeles. It doesn't matter, okay? So we'll go ahead and pick San Francisco. I have that selected in blue, but I'm not done yet. So once I have it selected in blue, I'm gonna scroll back up here and I'm gonna look at this date and time set of sliders. This is where I can actually pick the time of year or the date in the year and the time of day that I want the sun to be set up for. So for example, it's already set for today, but I can change this slider and notice that it starts off at like four in the morning. That's obviously the sun is not at the correct angle. So we need to make sure it's daylight. So we'll pull this slider over. Now this is where you have to kind of decide where, what time of day do you want the sun to be in? Uh, and so if you have some idea of what your orientation is, sometimes that can help because you can decide which, which, whether you want it to be morning or afternoon. I tend to like the longer shadows, so I tend to creep this down into the earlier or later, uh, late afternoon or early morning time frame. Um, if it is daylight savings time, which it currently is, we can check the box for daylight savings time. That shifts the, the sun just a little bit. Notice also that when I slide this, these two angle calculations change. So we can actually see the angle of the sun change, and we can see the height of the sun or the azimuth of the sun change. Um, but it's a whole lot easier to move the sliders than to, to type in values here. So I'm going to pick the time of day. We'll go about like that. And I'll scroll up the rest of the way. Everything looks pretty good. Notice my orientation here is assuming that y is north. That's by default. So if I looked at my little axes down here, y is that way. So my view that I'm looking at right now isn't actually, uh, I'm looking south as opposed to looking north. Um, so anyway, I have that set up. Once I'm done, I'll say OK. And I, one of the things that happens here is people assume that, oh, my son's done. I specified everything. It's done. Well, it's not because you haven't actually inserted the sun in the scene. If you look at your command line, it's saying position for the sun. You can put it at 000. You can put it and snap it to the top corner of your building. It makes no difference other than you need to be able to find it again at some point. The sun is universally shining in one direction. Uh, it's meant to mimic the sun as if it was really far away like it is. So we can't tell other than the light is all hitting in one direction. So same thing happening here. So there's my sun. It looks a lot like that directional light that we've done before. The difference is in the power of the light. It's a lot brighter because it's a sun. If I wanted to change the settings on this particular sun, if I have it selected, I can go to the properties. Um, and it will, let me go to the light properties here. And there'll be a big button for modify sun right at the top. We'll go ahead and click on modify sun. It brings us back to the sun angle calculator. We can uncheck manual control and go back through and change the date and the time and all the rest of it. I'm not going to do that right now, but you guys can do that if you want or if you're unhappy with the, the date and the time of day, uh, etc. OK, so now I have a sun in the scene. That's a good first step. Once I have the sun in the scene, I need to establish what the sky is going to look like. The sky currently, even though I have a sun, is still black. So I need to make sure that I, that I actually assign a sky. So we're going to go up into the V-Ray options. So I'm going to go to the V-Ray menu and then choose options or click the button with the O on it right here. And this brings up the V-Ray options editor. We've done this before. I'm going to click on the rollout here for environment, so the environment drawer is showing. And then under both the GI skylight and the reflection refraction background, I'm going to click the M next to um, uh, the, the rest of the details here, which is going to let me get in and create an actual map for this background. I'm going to click here, and instead of choosing text bitmap, which we've done many times before, I'm going to scroll all the way down until I find text sky. And so when text sky is selected, I get some default sky options right here. One of the choices is where is my sun? And so there is a rhino document sun, and then there's a long string of numbers. That long string of numbers is the sun I just inserted into the scene. So I'll choose that as my sun. That ties the sky to the sun. So the, the, the color of the sky is going to vary based on how high the sun is in the sky. So Rhino's going to, or V-Ray is going to calculate that for us. So I have that tied to my specific sun. I'll say, okay, that's good. I'll come down to the reflection and refraction background. Same thing. I'll click on the lowercase m. 
I'll choose text sky and I'll tie it to my son. Yeah. So it's able to figure out the colors like based on what the atmosphere is filtering out. Right. Right. It's mimicking the atmosphere. The, the, the only thing that this is not doing is, is it's assuming that it's a clear sky as opposed to one with clouds. So the rendering will be as if the sky were clear with no clouds in it. We'll get to where we have clouds and, and sunspots and that sort of stuff. That's next class. But for right now, it's approximating what the, the gradient of the sky is from dark blue to almost white. And if you were to go out on a sunny day, terrible day to, to, to point out any illustrations today, uh, but if we were to go outside, you would see that. And that color, that range of blue to kind of very light blue, would change over the course of the day depending on how high the sun would be. And so V-Ray is essentially calculating that for us based on the position of our sun that we just put in. So I'll go ahead and say OK. And I've done that both for the GI skylight and for the reflection and refraction background. So I've now set this up so that I have a sun in the scene. That's part one. Part two, I have the background established so that the sky is going to look correct. And the third part is that if I were to render right now, everything would be completely blown out bright white. And that's because when I do my rendering, I need to pretend that there's an actual camera exposing the scene. So V-Ray gives us the option, and we haven't done this yet um, in class, it gives us the option to turn on a physical camera as if we were walked outside and had to take a picture. So we're going to do the same thing. So up here, I'm going to close up the environment drawer. Right above it is the camera drawer. In that camera drawer, I want to come down to where it says physical camera, and I need to turn that on. So I'm going to check the box to turn that on. The good news is almost all of the default options are just fine. Though you'll notice if you took 135 with me that there's a bunch of familiar things like your aperture, your film speed. There's a lot of settings that you can change. Generally speaking, the default options are just fine. The only thing that we're going to worry about is the shutter speed, which is right here. This shutter speed is actually one over this number in seconds. So right now, the shutter speed is listed as 300. That means it's 1 300th of a second. So the higher this number goes, the darker the image becomes. The lower this number goes, the lighter the image becomes. Does that kind of make sense? OK. So I'm going to leave it as the default at 300. I don't know if that's going to turn out. We're going to have to test the rendering and see. OK, so I have my physical camera turned on. We'll go ahead and close the V-Ray option editor. And we'll come back to my scene here. It's time to get down to one of those views that I established. I'll go down to set view. I'm going to go to pr the uh, perspective two view, I think. I might go to the perspective one. There we go. That one's a little bit better because I'm seeing the, the angle there on my building. OK, so I have this view. It's at street level. If I were to render this right now, what I would see on the screen is what I would get. So I'd not actually see the upper part of the building. And if you guys have walked downtown San Francisco, when you're walking along the street, a lot of what you see is just this, right? with the glass kind of going up out of your view. You have to crane your neck up to see. We can tell V-Ray that we want it to render more than what we see, though. So I'm going to go ahead and go into my uh, V-Ray options again. I'll go to V-Ray and then Options. And then down here under Output, I'll make that a little bit bigger. And you'll see that I have the ability to type in a width and a height. Well, I know my building's really tall, so I want my width to be narrow. So I'll say maybe, and I, I always do this in very small numbers first to do my test renderings before I beef up the size. So I might say my width of 100. And I might say my height really should be about 600. So I'm, I'm going narrow and tall in my rendering. I'm not copying my viewport. So I'm overriding that by typing these values in. So I'll go 100 by 600, and we'll see what happens. I'll go ahead and close my V-Ray option editor here. And then I'll go ahead and start a rendering. I'll go to Render and then Render. Or I'll click on the Render button, or I'll click on the blue R button. Any of those will get me there. And you can see that my, my orientation here is tall and skinny. And it looks like my 600 was way too much. I could probably reduce that down to maybe 300 or 400. And remember, I'm rendering small 
so that I can get a sense for, does the light seem OK? Does the sky seem OK? And we'll let it finish up here. Zoom in here a little bit. The exposure of the scene seems right. It doesn't seem too bright. It doesn't seem too dark. Well, this is reasonable. This is about what I wanted it, how I wanted it to turn out. And so you can see right now we've got our, our gradient happening in the sky the way it should. OK, all of this seems pretty good. I need to up the size of the rendering a little bit. So we'll go back to my V-Ray options. I think my ratio was off at 600. I think this is maybe 400. I might do a quick test to make sure that that includes my whole building. So we'll come back and we'll start the render again. And you'll find as you start to do these kinds of renders that it takes repetition. You need to try it. You need to see, OK, that's pretty good. I might be able to cut that down to maybe 350 or even 200 in this particular view. So I can go back to my V-Ray options. We could say, let's go back to 300. And we'll go back and start that rendering again. Yeah, OK, that's showing the bulk of my building. I like the exposure. If I wanted it to be lighter, I would go into my V-Ray options. And again, I'm showing you this. I think it happens to be pretty good. But I'm showing you this just so you know how to change it. I would go into my camera. I'd say I want it to be lighter. I'd drop this number maybe to 150. And you'll see as soon as I do the rendering that the whole thing is going to be brighter now. See how everything got brighter? The sky got brighter, etc. Likewise, if I wanted it to be darker, I'd come back here and I'd change this value up from 300. So maybe 200 is right. It actually didn't look too bad, a little bit brighter. So we'll try it at about 200. So at this point, I'm ready to do a higher quality rendering to see what the, the end result looks like. So before I do that, I want to make sure I save my file. But I'm going to go into Output. And I'm going to, at this point, lock the ratio. So this little L button here will lock the ratio, which will allow me to change these up. So I might go to 1,000 by 3,000, for example. Or maybe I don't want to be quite that aggressive. Maybe I'd go 500 by 1,500. But notice that it changes based on the same ratio for me. I don't have to do any math. So once I have that set up, I'm ready to start kind of a final rendering. These renderings can take a little bit longer to do. We will get to the point next class where we'll start using the distributed rendering farm. And I'll show you guys how to do that. Uh, for today's purposes, you're kind of borderline. It's not really going to help too much. So we're going to just proceed as a normal rendering. Uh, this render could take 10 minutes, could take 15 minutes. Depends on the complexity of the building and the reflections around it. So I would go ahead at this point and perform the render. Let me go ahead and save it. And then I would start that render and let it render. I will let it render. Uh, so you guys can see the final result. But I wanted to come back and revisit the idea of a proxy object. Um, and so basically, what I just did is how far you need to get today. If you end up with extra time, you can work on your topo file if you want to. You can work on your skyscraper if you want to. I'm going to try to go get cardboard and cut the laser cut file and show you guys that demo. I I was thinking I might postpone because it was raining, but it's not raining anymore. So I want to try to give you guys enough time to, to work on that. So that means I have to go do that. So I'll be gone for a little bit. So you'll be on your own uh, for a while. But I think this is fairly self-explanatory. There are references to all of the tutorials. So if you get lost on a step, go find the tutorial that it references. Uh, and it'll get you unstuck for the time being. So the optional part of this was the V-Ray proxy object. Uh, I'm warning you ahead of time that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The concept is fantastic. And so what V-Ray allows you to do is it allows you to create a special kind of object that is kind of like a block reference for V-Ray only. So it takes the geometry, the materials, and packages them up into an external reference that V-Ray can see and will load in when you do the rendering it takes it away from existing in Rhino. It gives you a little preview of a couple random triangles to know that the object is there. But it takes away the heaviness of the file. So on something like this, it can be useful. So I'm going to jump out for just a second of my drawing so you can see this happen. Uh, one quick note, if you want to establish your views first, where you can see the whole scene, that's useful. Because once you create the proxy object, you can't see if you're inside a building anymore. 
one of the other buildings. So you create your views first. I already have two of the views set up for you, so for today's purposes, you don't need to worry about that. But I'm throwing that out there going forward. OK, so with that, with that said, I'm going to select the mes meshes by clicking on the SF model. I right click, and I say Select Objects. This is going to select all of those mesh um, objects, this, the city of San Francisco. They have their material applied to them. That's important. They have to have that applied first, which is good. Uh, and now I'm going to try to create the proxy object. I did save it right before I did this, just in case something were to crash. OK, so then I'll come up here to the V-Ray toolbar. And toward the very end is kind of a uh, tree-looking object at the very end. And if I hover over it, we see two options. The regular uh, left-click option is to import a proxy. And the right-click option is to create the prop proxy, or they call it writing the V-Ray proxy. So I'm going to right-click on that button. And it's going to say, where do you want to save the VR mesh file? This is that external reference that it's going to be creating. So I would go into my folder for today. And we'll go to um, his folder right there. And I will call this SF uh, VR mesh for lack of a better term. And I'll go ahead and click on the Save button. That then brings up, there's the location of my file. Export all selected objects as a single mesh file. That's good. Auto automatically create proxies. Warn me for existing files. That's good. And I can also set a preview for the mesh count. This is how many little triangles make up this big, complex object. Uh, it's set at 100 by default. You'll see that 100 is not a lot of triangles. Uh, I could up this to 1,000, but this is where you control how heavy the file becomes afterward. I'm going to leave it at 100, and I'll go ahead and say OK. So this can take a while. It can look like it's going to crash. You just kind of have to leave it alone for a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and leave it alone. I'll pause the recording. You guys can all start. When it's done, uh, I'll come back and show you what it looks like. <coughs> OK, so it finished creating the proxy object. And like I said, it's a little weird. So Rhino just got a lot faster. I can move around really easily. I still see my object. I still see the ground here. But all of that city that was heavy is represented by this whole series of little triangles. It doesn't mean much right now, but it makes my file faster. However, when I go to set up my view, so if I go back to set up perspective one, there it is. I'm not seeing anything, but when I go to render, which I'll start now and let it run on the screen, all of that San Francisco downtown will come back into the render file. So it's a, it's a little trick to, to make your file a little bit smaller and easier to work with. You do, of course, have to keep the mesh file and make sure you have that mesh file uh, so that it renders correctly. If you lose the mesh file, like an InDesign file, you lose the, the source image, you lose the ability to render it. So I'll go ahead and start that rendering, um, and then I'll keep helping the rest of you. <laughs> 